My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. Uh, you can go and write a review on iTunes, you can leave a comment on YouTube, or you can simply make a donation. Today, for the second time, my guest on the show will be BioViva CEO Liz Parrish. Liz recently made headlines around the world by uh, administering two types of gene therapies on herself. And I thought uh, it would make uh, for a fascinating conversation if I bring her back on the show so that she can uh, tell us all about it. So without further ado, welcome back, Liz Parrish. Hi, Nicola. It's great to be here. Uh, I missed you over these last few months. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks very much. Well, uh, we've, you've been making headlines around the world, so uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation myself, I have to say. I have too. So let's, let's start by filling in people on all the sort of uh, the interesting, juicy details. So first of all, what were the two gene therapies that you administered on yourself? Where, when, and how did it happen? Okay, so BioViva is a company that treats biological aging with gene therapies. So we chose two gene therapies that we've been looking at for a very long time that target some form of biological aging, and I took both of them. Uh, so one of them is a myostatin inhibitor. Uh, it, uh, it's a gene that creates a protein that um, keeps myostatin from... Uh, keeping you from building muscle. So it helps you build up your muscle mass. Frailty kills 6% of the population. And that loss of muscle mass and the gain of fat that we get over time uh, could be attributed to things like diabetes type 2 and other diseases. Uh, the second uh, gene therapy that I took was uh, a telomerase-inducing gene therapy. It's the H-TERT gene. Uh, it creates an enzyme called telomerase, which uh, lengthens telomeres in cell culture and in animal studies. And what that does is create a biologically young cell. It also creates a, the ability for the cell to replicate more times uh, over time. So we have a, a, a basically an endpoint to replication uh, of our cells. They can only replicate so many times, and stem cell depletion is a killer. Uh, so this actually allows the cells to uh, replicate a multitude of times, and, and maybe infinitely if you have it turned on permanently. So how long ago was it that you administered these two gene therapies, one for uh, muscle mass and another for anti-aging? Okay, so we did this on September 15th. So as of tomorrow, it will be officially four months since, four in, months. since I had taken the therapies. And have you grown a, a third hand or a, an extra eye or I don't know, any side effects so far, <laughs> something weird happening? No, no, no strange side effects. We, we know what these genes do. We, we didn't anticipate any side effects or I wouldn't have taken them. Of course, uh, a third eye might be useful, uh, but I think that would, that would be a big uh, concern right now since it's not considered fashionable yet. So no, no, we had no adverse side effects. <laughs> okay. Before we dive into all the details of, of the pros and the cons and everything, let me just ask you, can you give us a little more detail? So you told us it's a uh, uh, anti-aging and uh, muscle mass uh, uh, therapies. You told us that they were administered uh, on September the 15th, so it's going to be four months tomorrow. Mm -hmm. where, where and when and how was this done? Well, we, we're, we're a bit elusive about that, I know, but we did. We, we um, are saying, uh, we're being open about that we did it in uh, South America, and uh, we did it in a medical clinic with a medical doctor and a medical staff. Mm -hmm. So you were under supervision? Absolutely, yes. I don't suggest uh, anything else. <laughs> to, to alleviate, if, if my audience has any concerns uh, in terms of uh, your vagueness, what's the reason behind uh, you, you not, not sharing those specifics with us? Well, there's a lot of reason. We actually actually need to protect the staff that was um, on site at the time um, for for a myriad of, of unknown reasons to their careers. Uh, these people are very um, important people in the world that would, would help us take a chance to create a therapeutic that may save the rest of the world from aging diseases in the future. 
Um, this is uh, something that we would just do naturally is to protect identities of people. So you're basically expressing some kind of a concern for the safety and or uh, perhaps the professional reputations of, of, of the people who assisted you in doing this? I have a feeling that their reputations are going to be um, a beautiful. There's good, they're going to have a beautiful future of their reputations. Uh, but right now, we're just protecting their privacy. We certainly don't want people contacting them and um, asking them you know, unnecessary questions. They're busy people with professional lives. Let me ask you this. Have those two gene therapies ever been tested before, be it in animal models, be it in other human subjects? Yeah, so the myostatin inhibitor actually had been tested in every acceptable animal model, including primates. And with another group in the U.S., it's going through FDA clinical trials for muscular dystrophy right now. So that one we felt really good about. Our medical doctor for BioViva took that gene therapy himself uh, over five years ago now. Uh, so the second one, though, the telomerase induction, had shown great promise in animal model. Uh, it had been in mice in two very um, uh, big studies, uh, one by Ron DePino and the other one by Maria Blasco. It had been used in cell culture, uh, human cell tissue, uh, over and over again with great results. So we're pushing this one forward uh, as quickly as possible because it really has the most promise in treating biological aging as a disease. And what were the sort of preliminary results, uh, whether in the animal models or in other human subjects, at the time that you decided to undergo such a test yourself? Yeah, well, the, the animal studies, the mouse studies were um, stellar. Uh, they had had reversal of biological aging. They had better organ function. They had better and increased size in brain uh, from atrophied old brains to uh, youthful brains. Um, everything from the interior of the animals to the exterior uh, improved in quality and youthfulness. And what about the human subject? The human subjects, uh, that was with the myostatin inhibitor, and actually that's going very well. It's in phase three uh, clinical trials with Be Becker's muscular dystrophy right now, and starting phase one with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So we felt very confident about that. Okay, so let's, let's just be clear. The myostatin inhibitor is for uh, muscle mass. Yes. Uh, for, for treating sarcopenia, as you said, and then... Uh, the telomer telomerous lengthening one was the anti-aging therapy. Yeah, well, we consider them both, um, uh, I guess, if you want to say an anti-aging therapy. Our, our company is vastly focused on disease mitigation. And so that's kind of how we talk about it, is we talk about it by, uh, th that we're trying to mitigate diseases of old age uh, and come back and cure childhood disease as well. So we, I think that they both tackle biologically a biological aging very strongly. Tell us a little bit more about sort of the study, the, the, the study protocol. Was was there someone who designed the, the study protocol? Did you do that yourself? And what's kind of the process? What's the, uh, I don't know, the regular blood tests that you undergo? What's the monitoring uh, data that you try to collect? Uh, how often is it collected? Uh, when do you expect results? And just give us the, the idea of the design of the study. Right. So we have our own protocol at BioViva, and we're developing that uh, vastly as we go. Uh, we were prepared. We had a lot of pre-blood uh, banked that was taken from me before procedure. We had tissue samples banked. Uh, we have gone on to do a myriad of blood tests, MRIs, and um, telomerase uh, it should be lengthening the telomeres. And so we have actually used two groups, two companies that lengthen, uh, not sorry, that lengthen, that actually measure telomerase. I mean, sorry, they measure telomeres. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we've got, we've got a lot of uh, different um, samples out and these are all with uh, third party groups. And so they will uh, show us the data. And that's, that's the most important part is the data. And how, uh, what, so can you be a little more specific or, or, or not on the kind of the types of data that you collect? How often do you collect it? What are the biomarkers that you're monitoring and things like that, perhaps? Right. So uh, the data that we're collecting is uh, obviously telomere length. Uh, we're, we are monitoring some organ function. 
Uh, so there's a myriad of blood tests that I do for that. We're going to have one group uh, monitor methylation of the cells to see if they actually look um, and behave more youthfully. And we'll be doing tissue samples. Uh, we're also doing MRI uh, imaging of the muscle mass, and that will be telling as well. And how often do you undergo those tests? Do you do that weekly, monthly, or how, how does that work? Well, it depends on the test. So some of them I do more often than other tests. Uh, blood work I op obviously do more often than I would do something like an MRI and, and certain sorts of imaging. So, And then some of them we have uh, pre-samples, but we don't have the, the post-samples run yet. So we're waiting a certain amount of time for, for each one of these to get done. And what would be a sort of an independent way uh, perhaps a third party that's kind of removed or independent from you as a way to confirm or deny, in, a, in other words, to uh, review and to verify the results. Right. So we have we have one group working on that at Harvard, and uh, we ask other groups to come forward, uh, groups that are interested, that are from institutions. We are happy to send them samples. Uh, we, we would love to have this verified in, in any way possible, uh, whether it works or whether it does not work. So uh, do you suffer yourself from any relevant medical condition that requires to be treated by such therapies, uh, such as... Uh, for muscle wasting disease or aging? Yeah, so I suffer from biological aging as a disease. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. And uh, this is something that we need to work on uh, very, very quickly if we want to have a future. I know that it, it sounds very odd to people. Um, people wonder why we would do that. A lot of people want to live their golden years um, refusing the idea that they'll die in the future. But this is a really important uh, set, series of tests that we're doing. This is a very important company to the future of mankind. Uh, the minute we can um, defeat uh, the, these diseases like Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease, uh, we're obligated to do so. Uh, so we think that these therapeutics may in fact help in these areas. And so it's a mandate that we try them and, and see if we can help people. Yeah, but what, what I was trying to get at is, is there any other specific condition above and beyond uh, the, the, what, what some would qualify as the normal or regular aging and or muscle wasting as we tend to get older? Right. Uh, that would kind of create incentives for you to actually go ahead and test these. Or are you basically uh, just... A, a sort of a healthy volunteer with no other impetus. Right. I, I, I understand the question, but, but what I'm trying to tell you is that even in very young people, we can see the buildup and the accumulation of junk. We can see the buildup of the things that will kill them in their later years. Uh, we're able to identify Alzheimer's as early as early 20s now. We can find atherosclerotic plaques in young children. We can find cancer cells uh, in young children and all throughout our life. We're just 80% more likely to get cancer after the age of 65. So um, I would definitely say that uh, since I turned 30, I have uh, had about the attrition of about 1% of my muscle mass every year since then. Um, I'll be 45 uh, this month. And um, definitely uh, with the, the right amount of imaging and scans and, and various things, we should already be able to pinpoint one of the couple things that I would be dying of in the next 40 years. Do you think that you are taking kind of a too much of a personal risk yourself in sort of administering these therapies on yourself rather than, let's say, allowing other volunteers to do that work uh, perhaps terminally ill patients or perhaps people who are having a much faster rate of regre uh, regression than, than you have? Because you've mentioned yeah. 1%. That's kind of like the average. Right. What would someone would say the normal rate of uh, deterioration? But we know that there's a number of health conditions where that's accelerated tremendously. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do believe that somebody who was terminally ill should have taken these therapeutics. I think they should have had the right to access these therapeutics. And I think our company should have had the right to give these uh, in the U.S. Uh, to any terminally ill patient. Unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, regulation and red tape, and we're trying to expedite uh, good work. Um, I went ahead and took the, the chance because I believe that this risk uh, could create a healthier world. Um, and with one of the therapies never being tried in a human before, we felt that it was an ethical issue, uh, that we were the company that took the first chance and, and saw what happened. So basically, that's kind of answering also the, the elusiveness question too. I mean, why you couldn't do this in the United States as you would have preferred to do it and why you have had to go abroad to try and do it and why kind of now you're giving us uh, some kind of a vague or n not too specific answers because of, of, of that concern and, and that issue, I think. Yeah, I mean, the only play, the only thing that we've really been vague about is, you know, who the medical staff was and, and the exact location. And I, I, you know, I mean, we've been very transparent about everything else. So I can't, I can't um, feel sorry for anyone who, who doesn't like that. You don't know exactly where I sleep or <laughs> exactly where I go shopping either. And, um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I guess I don't see that, that that should be an issue in itself. Uh, we did have a film crew there. Uh, they did um, video uh, the, the therapy, and um, that, was, that was fantastic. They'll continue to follow up, and, and they want to be there when I do uh, some of the blood work. They're in a different state than I am. Uh, but uh, uh, the most important thing is that we've started and that, the, the world uh, learns about this and understands about this. We're not asking anyone else to come forward. We're not asking uh, anyone in my age range um, to come forward. We want to move forward to use these therapies uh, in terminally ill patients. We want people to have the right to use them. Uh, there's over 100,000 people die every day of aging diseases, and this is, this is a mandate. This is very important. I mean, we just lost uh, a couple of, uh, well, a few great performers uh, of, of our days, uh, David Bowie, Alan Rickman, and, and Lemmy from Motorhead. Uh, we lost them all to um, aging diseases since this year started, and I think that, you know, this is a mandate to, to rush to our future. Uh, this is a future for everyone. The minute we can cure disease, we should be doing that. Yeah, I remember being a teenager in Bulgaria and, and uh, listening to Lemmy's music at the time. <laughs> yeah, he's cool. He was cool. Yeah, he was very cool. In the 80s, especially, Motri Hat was uh, very popular. Very cool. Um, let me ask you this. Why start? There's so many therapies. There's so many amazing gene therapies that one could start doing work on. Yeah. Why start with these two? Why, why these two were at the top of the list for you? So we're going for the biggest impact. So definitely lengthening telomeres. That science has uh, the best work behind it uh, as far as tackling biological aging. It has a lot of promising research, and we were really excited about that research. Uh, the myostatin inhibitor is just a, it's a real complement, actually, to the telomerase uh, lengthening gene therapy. And um, we, this felt like a, a lower-hanging fruit. Sarcopenia is something that a lot of companies are going after, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, even the Buck Institute has been working on sarcopenia. This is kind of an entry level for uh, the enthusiast of people who want to live younger and better now, who aren't thinking about bigger picture things. They're still thinking in lines of hormone replacement and growth hormone and, 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 and things like this. They're thinking of, you know, if I get stronger, you know, um, I will live uh, better and well. And, and, and that, that is true true, especially in later years. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a benefit uh, to the, these type of therapeutics, that these are more entry level. This is where people are thinking. Now, reversing biological aging and potentially the looks of someone, reversing that back to uh, a young state uh, is uh, where we want to be. Uh, we're not an aesthetic company. We're not a, a cosmetic company. We're a disease mitigation company. But we know that if you look younger all the way through, 
cross sections all the way through your organs and everything, you are less likely to die of the aging diseases. So this is this is sort of the mother load. This is this is the the most powerful therapy uh, that we could we could be going after. So both of them complement one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, I agree with you. And I actually think that uh, it's not a hundred, but more like a hundred and fifty thousand people dying per day. Yeah, I always try to keep it conservative. Uh, that other fifty thousand uh, just it breaks my heart even more. Now, specifically on the on the kind of uh, the, the the process, I'm curious. Why did you decide to do them both simultaneously? I mean, is there no risk of sort of cross pollination or sort of creating too much noise in the signal and cannot be uh, and running the risk of not being able to differentiate uh, which therapy led to which kind of what kind of changes and when and how uh, so why test two at a time rather than one and then be very clear about what the result was Right. So the medical team that we had worked with, uh, some of them had worked in some pretty serious diseases in the past. For instance, one of our uh, medical advisors had worked with AIDS patients. And, you know, when they first started treating AIDS, uh, they started treating AIDS from, you know, one type of therapy for each person, but each one of those therapies targeted a different uh, part of the disease. And what was happening in those early years is patients were dying. They were having some sort of you know, benefit, but dying. Uh, but the companies were refusing to put the, the cocktail together initially, and that's eventually what they did and had uh, much better results. So we looked at these two gene therapies and we looked at their mechanisms uh, and they actually benefit each other um, very well. For, for, for several different reasons. And we decided to uh, go for, for the harder hit and, and actually use them separate, use them together. Now in the future, we'll use them separately in uh, disease states and run forward with, with trials offshores uh, to see how each one of them works in a specific disease state. Um, but together we think that uh, they work uh, better. So it seems that there there's some kind of a synchronicity between uh, the two therapies where perhaps, or at least you're hoping that they would kind of uh, enhance each other's uh, efficacy, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. So before we actually start discussing uh, if and, and whether you have any actual uh, results that we can talk about, let me uh, keep our conversation a bit longer in the theoretical realm. So let's talk about the, the best case and the worst case scenario. So let's start with the best case scenario first, because this is the motivation that made you attempt to do this in the first place. So in your view, what's the best case outcome that you're hopefully aiming for with these two therapies? Oh, wow. Well, the best case outcome is that we see a reversal of biological aging. We see uh, the system become healthier and we can start to work on our, our plan of how we get this, uh, these therapies to the world, you know, to people. Uh, that that's the, that's the best case scenario. Um, of course, we still have to be very careful. Each patient, uh, n equals one, is is a big deal. Uh, but n equals a hundred and n equals a thousand, uh, even better. So uh, we need to make sure, of course, that they work the same in each one of those persons. And the flip side of the coin is the worst case scenario. We know that. Most therapies, uh, in fact, as high as, uh, according to some estimates, 90% of uh, things that are being uh, researched or uh, trialed uh, with, with human subjects uh, by big pharmaceutical companies actually never make it to market and don't actually uh, seem to work, especially when migrating from the animal model into the human subject. So let's talk about the worst case scenario. What's the worst case scenario? So the worst case scenario would be no outcome. Uh, that would be the worst case scenario to me. Uh, a lot of people come up with a lot more uh, grueling and, and horrible, uh, disgusting outcomes like uh, death and cancer. But uh, to me would be uh, no outcome. Uh, we just don't see the biomarkers change. Uh, that would be, uh, you know, that, that would be the worst case scenario. Right. And, and I agree that that will be the worst case scenario for the collective sort of for, for, for humanity or for us interested in this topic. But for you specifically, personally, I would also have to say that those people do have a point that you are kind of 
taking perhaps a, a huge risk personally, and there is a lot worse case scenario than that pertaining to your own self and health and, and, and so on. Right. And, you know, I mean, I'm always a little bit surprised by that. Um, sometimes, you know, I think that people think that they need to protect other persons. Uh, I went into this knowing uh, full well what I was doing. I went into it um, reading every paper that I could, examining everything I could, and this is my life. I studied death for two years. I, I, knew, I know how I'm going to die um, if I didn't do it. Uh, so I wasn't really uh, going to take the status quo. So I don't have the same uh, fears and worries that other people do, and I hope that people understand that you know this was my human right to do, and I hope they enjoy the data, uh, however it comes out uh, positive or negatively uh, from this. Now you're blowing my mind here with with a bunch of things that you said and you have been saying. So tell us first of all, how do how does one study death for two years? <laughs> Well, uh, what we launched on was the first presentation that we launched on was actually uh, called How We Die. And it was a perspective. I was actually warned not to do this presentation. I was told no one will like this presentation. Nobody wants to sit and listen to How We'll Die. Uh, but I was determined to do it, and, and I did, and I got a great reception for it. And it is basically how we die by the numbers, how we've died historically. Uh, if I was somebody in 1665, I've certainly outlived uh, <laughs> my neighbors uh, by over 10 years now. Uh, you know, we used to die of infectious disease. That was considered normal. And uh, we, I did this presentation vastly to prove to people that what we consider normal is a situation opinion that in fact it is not uh, a fact it doesn't have to be a fact we can change the way we die and science has done that historically um, since we started uh, started science we have changed um, the precipice of how we live and um, and I think that vastly how we die has to do with how we live how we see the world uh, changes when we change uh, that that one thing so this is this is what I did. I looked at the numbers. You know, we 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 studied uh, greatly the numbers of people who would die of cancer and heart disease. Those are the two biggest killers. And then you go on to kidney failure and diabetes type two and uh, Alzheimer's. And you take uh, much of the childhood diseases right off the board because they don't even compute anymore. But we know that they they happen and they they are devastating. So uh, that's that's what I spent my time doing. And um, and I'm I'm kind of happy to not know exactly how I'll die. Oh, but, but I thought you said that you knew how you would die. I did until I, the moment I took those therapies. <laughs> okay, and now you, now you know you have changed the outcome or you hope that you would? We don't know. We don't know, but it's possible that we have and it's possible that um, th that possibility uh, gives me some hope. You know, I, when I came home, I, I wrote down... Um, into a, a transcript that I'm, I'm turning into, you know, my diary of, of, of things that are going on. I, I wrote down, you know, if, if, if you could do one action that might save a thousand people or a million people or a billion people, but you might die from doing it, would you do it? And then I wrote, I would, and I did, and I'm going to tell you my story. And, you know, I really didn't know what would happen uh, then. I didn't know what would happen the next day. And um, I just feel very strongly that we have to pioneer a new medicine, that we cannot uh, wait for these slow routes of, of money-making machine companies that have had no incentive to cure disease. You know, that, that's not their business. We need business that cures disease. And uh, I think what's funny is uh, recently I, I saw the interview. I didn't watch it, but I saw the interview that I did with you a while back. And I, I, I noticed in the picture I was smiling. There's me and you and our heads are together and I'm smiling because, you know, I knew I was about to do that. You know, I knew when I was talking to you that I was, and, and, <laughs> and I, you know, I felt confident about it then, and I still feel confident about it, and, and I'm okay with, with whatever outcome comes, as long as it 
can be put into data that helps people in the future. That's, that's just, that's the most important thing because if we don't do it, we know the outcome. People say, Oh, why would you take a risk? But you know, you're going to die. What are you going to do with your time here? You know, are you going to hang on to your wheelchair and your cane to the last minute? Throw it aside before you even have to grab hold of it. It's time to make a change. We have to pioneer a new future. You know, we've got to do it together. Wow, those are very powerful and passionate words. But uh, perhaps speaking of those risks again a little more, uh, can you share with us what uh, Aubrey de Grey's comments were when he heard that you had tested uh, those uh, therapies on yourself? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, I, 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 after doing it, I contacted someone in the company, uh, to let them know that I had, that I had in fact done it. And, um, and the, the word, you know, the, those persons started contacting other persons, uh, in our scientific advisory board. And I, I cannot say that this was Aubrey, but I, I know that, uh, one person was contacted in the scientific advisory board and the the gentleman that, that helps with bioviva called me back and he said well so and so will talk to you if you live for nine days <laughs> and um and i said well that's fine i'm gonna live for 15 <laughs> and uh and i've just kind of kept going since then so i think it's gonna i think it's gonna be okay <laughs> well, I really, I really hope so, Liz. I really hope so, Liz. It's been four months now, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, what everyone wants to know is like the results now. So first of all, have you grown a fourth hand? And uh, or I think I asked you that already. But what are what are the results? Uh, we we discussed. I think already we touched that you don't have any negative. Uh, uh, you know, effects on you. Yeah. Are there any positive ones and what are they if you do? So, you know, I mean, that, that those are the things that are really hard to talk about because, um, you know, there, there is the effect of thinking that one has been affected, right? Uh, so there's the placebo effect. And um, so if you ask me about things, uh, I will probably uh, tell you a myriad of, of benefits that I've seen. Uh, but to actually turn those into scientific fact, we have to gather the data. And so we're still gathering that. We're going to gather that over the next 18 months. And, um, and then we'll have a bigger picture. But, you know, data is king and the scientific data is number one. So I feel great. Um, I'm sleeping really well. Um, I am, I'm feeling stronger. Um, I'm appearing to build muscle mass. Uh, Hulking up, and are you getting younger? I don't know. I, I definitely uh, have more muscle mass uh, than I had before. Uh, I have I have actually spoken to people in the uh, bodybuilding industry. They have analyzed my body and said that I have more muscle mass than I should for my age for someone who's not taking testosterone and and hormones. Uh, are you but. Oh, I always work out. I, I've been an I've been an avid runner and a, a, a workout enthusiast <laughs> for for years and years. Um, so that's that's by the way, guys. That's the number one way to keep your body as young as possible. You know, eat healthy and uh, exercise. Number one. You know, weight. Well, you look so fantastic at forty five. I mean, I I never say you're forty five. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but you know, as far as like biologically uh, reversing and aging, you know, we don't know. You know, that'll be in the data. Uh, that'll be the the more important parts. Uh, that will take time uh, to find out, and that'll be an organ function and 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 various other uh, tests. I'm anxious to find out. Yes, we we all are actually, and and actually, that's one of the questions that uh, Dr. Michael Fossil uh, sent me for you. Uh, he was asking. Uh, namely, how will you know if your therapy is successful, especially since you're healthy and not obviously old or ill? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that I talked about that. So biologically, uh, I have uh, many signs of aging. Biologically, uh, my cells are, are not young. Uh, they're not as old as an 80 year old, but they're definitely a middle aged uh, cells. So we should see a change there. 
Uh, I just talked to Michael Fossil's class the other day. He, he brought me in on Skype. That was fun. I, I like him. He's, he's got great energy. So we'll be looking at a lot of biomarkers. If he has some suggestions, he's uh, welcome to, to throw some out. Uh, I know that he'll be looking for uh, similar things in his patients as he raises money for his company. Yes, but, but, but that was kind of my, my question was like, can you be by any chance anymore? Like, do you have a, I don't know, a, a baseline of comparison of something that would say, this is how it was before test. This is how mm -hmm. it was after test. Therefore, right. we failed or we succeeded greatly. Right, right, right. So that's what I was telling you. We have pre-blood stored. Uh, we've sent some of it out. We've have, we have all of my blood work uh, from before. Uh, the therapies. Uh, we have my telomere length uh, before the therapies. Wow. And all of those will be looking at those biomarkers. We have an early MRI, uh, so we can look at later MRIs. So we're doing everything against the baseline uh, to what happens, you know, one year and 18 months out from therapy. Okay, so you're giving us another 14 months of uh, suspense, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and it'll probably even go on from there. You know, this this will this will be a a, a long uh, term study. You know, people who are interested in these sort of therapies uh, have to realize that humans are very long lived. If you uh, watch me to the end of even my natural days, you'll probably die waiting for a cure right? That's why we started now, uh, because we really don't have a lot of time, and the data that we can collect over my lifetime uh, will vastly help uh, people who are being born right now. Okay, but but if we were to, because uh, I mean, when we test uh, a new therapy, the hope is that we would, then the next step is that we would kind of say, uh, have a sort of a wide-scale popular uh, uh, acceptance, providing that we have positive results, and therefore right. it will we will make it available to to others or to the majority of the population. Right, right. Uh, you must have a sort of a cutoff timeline point in which, after which, you kind of know whether that's successful or not, and whether you 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 can actually start undertaking any other steps. Right. So that's why we've set the, the 12 to 18 month uh, guideline, and then we can analyze uh, things from there. What we'd like to do as a company is raise money to actually try these therapeutics in the terminally ill offshores now. Uh, there we should see a, a more dramatic potential change, and especially in much older persons. And uh, we're hopeful that we would ov obviously see their diseases uh, remiss and, and potentially uh, go away altogether. But it's very difficult uh, to work, you know, in people who are, are really sick and the outcomes are unknown. If the body is too sick, you can't really get ahead of it. One of the great reasons uh, for me to take uh, the therapeutics is this. We know that in the future, once we tackle this, this aging uh, paradigm, this aging problem, this biological problem of the cells, we'll be giving these therapeutics younger and younger. Uh, we, we just need safety and efficacy. We need to ensure that they don't affect the germline. And what I mean by that is they don't affect offspring of, of those patients. Maybe at first we'll give them in maybe the 40s to 50 range out of childbearing years, and then we'll move back. Preventative medicine happens a long time before you get sick. Uh, so certainly right now it appears the ethical thing is to work in the very sick and we need to because we need to save those persons. But in the future, I would say 20 or 30 years, I hope, we'll be using these younger and younger so that people don't get sick to begin with. We, we, got, we have to stop battling the symptoms of these of biological aging you know these are these are really expensive diseases and uh, they they have not moved from the map since we started and that's because we were never tackling them in the right way we have to tackle biological aging that's the only way to nip those diseases in the bud mm -hmm. and the the the, the follow-up question that Michael Fosso has is what will you do next? Uh, provided that you're successful. Do you plan to expand this study into dozens or more patients? And you kind of touched on that, but perhaps you can add some more. Right. You know, our hope is For to... Example, yeah. Will you be treating healthy and perhaps wealthy patients or will you aim for those with age-related diseases specifically? 
You know, bioethics is a very funny thing, but certainly we have to, uh, we have probably our, our own bioethics in the sense that we, we believe in the right of trying to save every life. Uh, but we do believe that, that right now we need to start in the terminally ill, that therapeutics should be made for the terminally ill so that we can get the data. I can't give you a therapy that I don't know what's going to happen to in two years if you're relatively healthy and could live those two years with, without incident, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we do, we do need to raise money to run trials offshore of the U.S. Uh, we can run them at a fraction of the cost. That's a, the big benefit. And we can actually get these into people so we can find out if they work for you. And, 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 you know, that's what's important to you, right? Um, I think that vastly the people who put their money into this will be people who want to own a company like this, who uh, want this sort of future for themselves, want to ensure they get this future, because you can't just know that this type of therapeutic exists and think that suddenly you're, when you're on death's doorstep, you know, somehow you're going to get a therapeutic and, and get it administered to you. you people need to, to own these, these, these sort of companies and they need to get their, their themselves behind them. We need that, those sort of enthusiasts. And we need to uh, get these patients in who have no other option right now and see if we can, in fact, save their life. With a myostatin inhibitor, we'd like to start with people as young as 60 and see if we can increase their muscle mass, which we should be able to do. 60, yeah. Uh, 60, 60, okay. Yeah, six, 60, not six, <laughs> I don't know I what you- I thought you said 16, I was a bit- No, oh, no, 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 no. 16 should be 16 year olds. And uh, people over 60 and see if we can, uh, you know, increase their muscle mass and keep them from dying from frailty and, and see if we can increase their insulin sensitivity with that increased muscle mass and keep them from getting diabetes type 2. Yeah, as you said, uh, we need not only patients but and, and investors, but we also need uh, pioneers or people who are willing to take the risk, such as yourself. Uh, so uh, I want to congratulate you for that. Uh, Thank you. Let me, let me just ask you about the, the costs. What are the costs associated with uh, any such potential treatment? And given the potential for uh, economies of scale, how do you think that cost would change if we're treating, let's say, a few people, if we're treating uh, hundreds of people, and if we're having a mass scale market adoption of the treatment? How is that cost going to change? Because that's very important and kind of connects to the issue of ethics. If it's very uh, unaffordably expensive, obviously very few people will be able to afford it. Right. So this is this is a big motivation of our company. You know, uh, we want to get those costs down and we can do that. Uh, we need investment uh, to build the pipeline and get the cost of the therapeutics down. Right now, each one of these therapies is hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, each therapy has to be uh, made for each person right now. Um, it, it, it's a specialized procedure. It's a slow procedure. It takes weeks or months uh, to get a therapy. So we need to uh, get the pipeline going. We need to get it up and running, and we can definitely get these costs down. This is one of the great things about our company is that uh, we want to not have to raise the amount of money that uh, these companies that are going through the FDA in the U.S. are raising. So we're seeing companies right now going through gene therapy clinical trials. They'll come out with a, a treatment, maybe a cure that will cost over a million dollars. Uh, that's where these therapies lie right now, but our company has the ability to, to half and quarter those costs within a few years and then even get them uh, less expensive after that. Uh, over time, I would say in five to seven years, uh, these could be built at such a scale uh, with manufacturing around the world that they could probably be disseminated for, you know, maybe tens of thousands or, or less at, at prices that insurance companies would definitely want to cover because they would be uh, covering less costs in the future for these patients. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. So you're saying, uh, actually, if we have uh, that uh, therapy working, then the insurance company will have an incentive to pay for it because in the long run, it's going to cost them less rather than allow people to simply age and deteriorate as they currently do. Oh, absolutely. And the U.S. government itself, uh, among other governments, you know, could save trillions of dollars just in one presidential term 
uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, coming up to an election. Who's, co- who's covering this? This, uh, I don't know. I don't think anyone is. But you want to save, you know, trillions of dollars for actually, the government. I actually government. interviewed him a, a month and a half ago, and he promised me the position of a secretary of state. <laughs> That's cool. So Zoltan Istvan is the first uh, openly transhumanist uh, presidential candidate uh, in the United States who also founded the Transhumanist Party. And for him, uh, defeating death and aging is uh, issue number one. Uh, So that's the fundamental uh, kind of goal that he's running on. Yeah, I've actually, I've met him and um, I think that that's really interesting. Obviously, we're a disease mitigation company, but people like that because if you're healthy, we don't know what you'll die of, right? We've already talked about that. Do you go on and on healthy or or is there something else? So um, I'm, I'm really happy that he's starting that conversation and I hope that he's starting it in a way that really gets uh, everyone interested outside of his, his own movement because uh, disease mitigation is, is very important. And um, I think that that is a strong part of the transhumanist uh, movement is to become better, stronger, smarter, faster people, you know, which is something that, you know, BioViva has always uh, talked about. Yes. And, and uh, hopefully not, not aged, but just uh, smarter and better in every way without. uh, And youthful. Right, right. So, you know, we, we want you to chronologically get older. We, we certainly don't want you to die in young of years. We want you to live as many years as you would like. We just don't want you to die of biological aging. It's costly. It's inhumane. Um, you know, I mean, it sounds like such a frivolous conversation, but, you know, go to a nursing home. Look at people who are dying of Alzheimer's and cancer and, and various diseases. This is, uh, this, is, this is not a humane way to let people die. The minute we can stop that, we need to stop that. Uh, Liz, let me throw in a couple of other uh, quick uh, audience questions uh, in the last couple of minutes of our interviews here. Uh, so, first of all, Michael C. sent me a question. It's a little bit general, but I thought perhaps you'd like to comment about, uh, he says, ask Liz Parrish about uh, what she thinks about the current CRISPR debate in gene editing and why or why not this is the way gene editing should go. Well, I think that the, the interesting thing, you know, a lot of the problems with with business and moving forward is patenting and licensing and, and various uh, problems therein. I'm not sure if he's talking about that or if he's actually talking about what's considered the ethical issues of, of gene editing. Uh, do you, can you choose one? Maybe we should talk about the ethical issues of, of gene editing of embryos because that, that's been one of the, the hottest topics in the news is, is whether in fact we should be editing uh, the embryos. So our company does not do that. Um, but I, I do say that I think that that is the future. If, if there is a known gene that causes a disease that's costly and takes away from that human's life and that we know that editing that gene out and replacing it with a good copy um, would help, we should, that's a mandate. Why would we bring sick children into the world? I, I don't understand that. We do so many things under the guise of ethics that are not ethical at all. You know, we let people die every single day that should be taking a therapeutic and trying a therapy, uh, uh, a gene therapy, a molecule, anything to save their, their lives. And yet we consider it more ethical to let them die. And we're actually condemning these children, these embryos to a future of, you know, sickle cell anemia, uh, hemophilia, and various other things that, that will in fact be curable diseases uh, in the very near future. Uh, But they should be cured before these, these children are born. And and there's worse than that. So um, I'm in support of CRISPR gene editing. I am, I am in full support of it. I mean, that's, kind of our business you know our business is to try to cure disease at the cellular level and uh and make a a, a better world a more humane world that's uh th- these uh technologies go hand in hand with that now as far as you know the the licensing and the patenting rights you know what now we run into yet another problem you know we had zinc fingers in the past but they were vastly owned by one company 
Um, we need the right to use these sort of therapeutics. Um, we need the right to use uh, CRISPR technology and other technologies that, that come out in, in the future uh, without you know, having to answer to, to companies. We need to answer to the world. We need to answer to uh, disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Uh, let me throw in a couple from Chelsea Lee Gilbert. She says, um, is Liz using any other therapies, drugs, vitamins, treatments aside from her own gene therapies? No, I do take vitamins. I said no first because I, I, I assumed that she was, uh, uh, you know, talking about some of the bigger players. Um, I'm not taking uh, hormones or anything like that. I'm just, uh, I'm taking vitamins and, uh, and that's about it. And you work out. And I work out. I've been working out, yeah. I'm always working out, but I've really been uh, focused on on really good health because I want a, a good outcome. I want an applicable outcome. What could happen in the best case scenario for people under the same circumstance? The second question that Chelsea asks is um, on her MAMA. Uh, Liz says that she keeps a diary or a journal, which you've mentioned already, mm -hmm. about what she thinks and she feels. Uh, is there anything major new thing uh, that you wrote there recently that perhaps you'd like to share with us? Oh, boy. Um, you know, that's that's funny because actually it's gotten very rather boring because, <laughs> you know, all my speculations and, and all my little fears, I would sneeze and go, oh, and I'd get down there and write it. I, I have sneezed. Maybe, you know, maybe this is the last sneeze of my life. Um, you know, no, I don't think there's nothing recent that would be spectacular. Uh, well, maybe uh, one thing uh, is that I did have an um, uh, increase in weight and yet a decrease in uh, the size of my waist. Oh, but muscle is heavier than other tissue. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> so I lost an inch off my waist, uh, but I, I got heavier. So that's, that's, that's probably, there's a good sign for you. Interesting. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what's the biggest misconception about the experiment with these two genetic therapies that you've undertaken? That something that kind of really annoys you perhaps and that you want to sort of uh, dismantle or, or clear, clarify once and for all? Jeez, oh, what would that be? Um, I guess, you know, I would like to uh, dismantle the fact that, uh, that, that they needed to be done separately. Uh -huh. I think that this is just as valid a science as, as any other. Uh, what else? Uh, you know, I, I, I would like, you know, I can't, I can't change the trolls. But of course, you know, you're going along and we get a nice article out and then somebody will say, you know, who's never read one of the papers, who's never, you know, put their time and energy into it. They'll be like, oh, this can't be true or something like that. I kind of wish that, you know, people uh, before just making negative comments because they tend to, you know, people like to be negative before they like to be positive, it appears. So the minute somebody says, well, you know, I think I, you know, I can debunk this with, without having ever read anything or know what's going on on in this science or anything else I wish that you know people would take the time to actually make a, an educated comment I guess and uh, to um, to to realize that, that that this isn't science fiction you know that this is science fact that this this type of technology had been around for a long time so Liz I've been enjoying our conversation today very much uh, but unfortunately I've kept you for way too long and our interview has to come to an end so let me ask you, uh, for those of our uh, viewers who are interested in following up with the latest development uh, with your experiment, what's the best place for them to do that? Well, you know, right now, uh, things are pretty quiet on our end. Uh, we're gathering data, and that get data will have to be analyzed just like anything else. I mean, we don't want to come out and say, oh, we've, we've you know, waving, you know, one, one result. So it's going to take some time. I would say that, uh, you know, 
keeping uh, up to date with the BioViva website, which is bioviva-science.com, would be uh, the place to start. I'm also on Facebook. BioViva Sciences INC is on Facebook as well. And that's probably the most updated um, site. We have a couple people working on that, and um, they will get out information as, as it comes. I, uh, I do tend to answer people's messages uh, when I can, but vastly um, until we have uh, really strong data, uh, there's, there's not too much to talk about. It, it, it's, a, it's a wait and see. Know that I'm, I'm doing my best here to uh, stay healthy, uh, to get the best results. I'm uh, living a very healthy lifestyle and, uh, and I'm working every day for your future. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, indeed, both working for our future in terms of defeating death, postponing aging, uh, improving our uh, or diminishing uh, muscle wasting disease like sarcopenia. Uh, but what would be the final message, the parting sort of uh, idea that you'd like to impart on us perhaps today at the end of this conversation with you? You always ask a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you ask a lot of good questions and they get me thinking. I think that um, I would like to depart and just say that no matter what, no matter what happens to me, you have to, we have to keep going on. I believe that I will be fine. We, we did a lot of research. We were very calculated in doing this. We have to be pioneers. We have to pioneer a future that we want to see. We can't go out there living through other people's fantasies. You know, we can't go out there being negative and, and thinking that the world will get better. You know, put your best foot forward, be a pioneer, and if you can't support those people who are doing that, you know, really look into what's going on in the world. Find, find something that you're passionate about and try to make a positive change in the world. You know, don't be a troll. You know, don't, don't, uh, it's okay to have your opinion and your opinion can be negative, but you know, don't be a person that's trying to defeat positive things. Go find the thing that, that inspires you, that makes your life worth living and do it. And, um, I, I mean, that, that's the only thing that changes the world. It's the only thing that ever has. So be a pioneer. Be a pioneer. Definitely. Be a pioneer. Do something different. This is your life. Um, I want you to really think about your life. I want you to really analyze it. And I want you to be positive about it. <laughs> I don't want you to get depressed because life is hard. Life is tough. It's tough for every single one of us. But, you know, look at your life and make a positive decision for you and the people around you. And, you know, I mean, sometimes even the people you don't like very much, you, you just make the world a better place. Challenge yourself. Liz Parrish, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. If you guys enjoyed this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes. You can leave a comment on YouTube or you can simply make a donation. Singularity.